I'm going to go ahead and uh, have you take it from here. Great. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today uh, speaking to you, although I cannot see many of you, uh, <laughs> but I have a crowd here. So, um, Kathy, do, do you want to have questions as we go, or we just go all the way? Um, so, folks, um, if you would like to ask Julio a question, go ahead and unmute yeah. yourself and, and butt in, because he's pretty easy going about that sort of yeah. thing. But if you're not comfortable doing that, go ahead and use the chat box like we've been doing. Yeah. So, uh, as Kathy said, a lot of the work that we do in my lab here at Cornell has to do with Reaper, but uh, Recently, we have also been working a little bit on the uh, use of technology to monitor health disorders in the early postpartum period. And that is what I'll be discussing uh, today. So some of the research that we have recently completed here at Cornell with the use of rumination and activity monitors for um, detection of health disorders. So everybody's uh, pretty well aware of the fact that lactating dairy cows go through a lot of different uh, stresses during the early postpartum period. So a lot of hormonal and behavioral changes that cows go through. And those changes are usually associated with uh, a reduced uh, immune response and negative energy balance. And it's during this time that cows tend to be prone to develop uh, several health disorders. So uh, most people are also well aware of these uh, disorders in the postpartum period in lactating dairy cows. We have retained placenta, mitritis, mastitis, DAs, ketosis, hypocalcemia, diarrhea, and pneumonia. So we have you know, a variety of uh, health disorders that are affecting our cows. So dairy farms will spend uh, quite a bit of time and effort trying to identify the sick cows in order to treat them or make decisions on whether or not it's uh, reasonable to treat these cows in order to improve their overall well-being and hopefully uh, both their productive and reproductive performance during lactation. So in terms of uh, what dairy farms do uh, to monitor cows for health disorders, uh, we have learned that it varies quite a bit. So we have some results from a recent uh, survey study that my group has conducted with uh, almost 60 commercial farms uh, ranging from 300 to 5,000 cows in the state of New York. And what we have found is that uh, dairy farms have quite uh, different uh, monitoring programs for health uh, problems in the early postpartum period. And just at a very basic level, one of the things that is interesting is that we have a majority of farms that uh, will check cows at least one time a day. So in this data set, 60% of the cows were checking cows once a day. But there was 36% of the farms that invested more time and effort on finding their uh, sick cows, and these farms would check uh, their fresh cows two or more times a day. And that's quite a significant proportion of the farms. It's almost 40% of them. They're spending quite a bit of time looking for their cows. And the other thing that was quite interesting about this data set is that we do have also a small proportion of our farms that do not check cows for health disorders. And uh, I'll come back to this graph uh, at the end of my presentation and I'll touch a little bit on what are some of the uh, potential strategies that these uh, two very different type of farms have. Those ones that do check cows very frequently and probably have a very detailed health monitoring program versus those farms that do not check cows. So, uh, you know, in uh, you know, in summer, you can say that there is a lot of variation in, you know, how farms, are, you know, how often they check for cows. There is also a lot of variation on how they evaluate cows uh, to determine the presence of health disorders, which also leads to pretty uh, different um, amounts of demands of labor and the type of aids used. So we have a lot more data with this that I'm not showing you, but basically these are our conclusions. So when, when you put this all together, in particular for farms that work very hard on finding their sick cows, uh, these health monitoring programs uh, end up being costly. 
they're time consuming and they usually require qualified labor in order to identify cows with health issues. So one of the uh, uh, you know, things that is interesting is that today we have the opportunity of uh, replacing uh, some of the labor and the effort uh, that farms are putting on finding sick cows with monitoring technology. So there has been in recent years almost you know, an explosion on the availability of different systems that monitor either behavior, physiological parameters, or productive parameters in cows that could be, in theory, used to find cows with health disorders. So there is then an opportunity to uh, potentially reduce uh, some of the burden uh, for dairy farms associated with this monitoring program, so reduce the amount of time and the amount of people that have to be dedicated to finding sick cows. But there is also a pretty interesting opportunity here to uh, uh, potentially reduce the disruption of cow normal behavior. So for most of the uh, farms that um, uh, that we included, for example, in our uh, study, in our survey study, they would check cows that were, uh, while they were locked in headlocks, it's not unusual for cows to spend anywhere from half an hour to an hour, an hour and a half uh, locked in, in, in headlocks while they are being checked. So I think that there is an opportunity to reduce the amount of time that we are disrupting uh, cow normal behavior, and we just saw in the previous presentation how important it is for cows to express their natural behaviors, to remain healthy, and to be productive. So again, uh, the, the basic thinking here is that now we have all these technologies that can potentially help us reduce uh, uh, the burden of health monitoring. As I previously mentioned, uh, in recent years, there have been a lot of systems that became available to monitor health uh, in cows, so most of these systems rely on sensor data. So these sensors will collect data automatically, the data will be transferred to some sort of software, and then this information becomes available to uh, uh, dairy managers. So today we have available um, systems that use uh, measure uh, activity to measure rumination time, for example. Uh, we also have ear tags that also measure activity, rumination time, body temperature, and, and a few other parameters. Uh, we also have ruminal boluses that uh, can measure body core, body temperature. And there are also some systems that rely on some of the uh, specific features of uh, milk. So there's the systems that basically monitor different parameters in milk, such as the uh, AFI uh, lab system, which, for example, uh, monitors uh, male components, male conductivity uh, to detect uh, metabolic disorders and mastitis. And there are also some systems available, not yet in the US, but it will probably be pretty soon, such as the uh, herd navigator system from uh, DLAVAL, which can measure uh, for at least four different parameters that I'm aware of, such as uh, BHBAs in milk, LDH to uh, detect ketosis, um, can also detect uh, uh, progesterone levels for reproductive management, and uh, I think that it can also monitor blood and uh, haptoglobin levels uh, in milk. So again, lots of different systems, uh, many of them are already available to dairy farms in the U.S., and uh, I'm pretty sure that you know, those that are not available will become available pretty soon. And then uh, there's a lot of ongoing research uh, in companies and universities trying to develop uh, new systems. However, um, even though we have these systems and we have had some of these systems for several years, uh, the amount of information that is available uh, about the uh, performance of these systems and how much uh, they can do for dairy farms in terms of finding cows with health disorders is not as um, abundant. So, uh, for example, I'm showing you here some data which has evaluated the uh, levels of physical activity. In this case, measure has a number of steps per hour, 
and also milk yield in kilograms per day in cows that had ketosis or cows that had a displaced submesome. And uh, here the thin line is for uh, physical activity. Day zero is the day of diagnosis of the health disorder by farm personnel. And as you can see, there was a quite dramatic reduction in the days uh, prior to diagnosis of the disorder in the levels of activity. There was also a reduction in the levels of milk production for cows with ketosis. And um, very similar pattern for cows with EA, there was a reduction in activity. Activity actually came back up a little bit uh, on the day of diagnosis, um, which is interesting. But anyway, so this is all uh, really great information. This information has been out there for a while, but this still doesn't, you know, help a lot. Uh, you know, dairy producers find seed cows. So there is still, you know, a lot of work to do and a lot to learn about this type of information. Here is another more recent data set. In this case, this is rumination and activity in cows that uh, present the health disorders. Uh, here you have rumination levels in this panel and then activity levels for cows that develop subclinical ketosis. And in this case, in particular, uh, the uh, levels of rumination and activity were monitored in the pre-calving, around calving, and immediately after calving. As you can appreciate, at least for rumination, cows that presented a case of subclinical ketosis in the early postpartum period, they did have reduced rumination compared to cows that did not have subclinical ketosis. Uh, similar results for activity, with activity being actually much lower uh, for cows with subclinical ketosis than cows without subclinical ketosis. <coughs> Again, so this, this information is very useful and it's very important to understand the patterns of these parameters around the uh, timing of uh, at which cows develop health disorders. However, there is very little information about how these type of technologies can help us identify cows that are suffering from health disorders. The data that I have uh, show, that I show, uh, show you previously basically is all retrospective data looking at what happened with these parameters in cows that develop the disorders, but there is very little data on how the systems can help us pinpoint those cows within our fresh cow groups that are suffering from a health disorders, from a health disorder. There is also very little information about the timing. So one of the things that uh, is critical uh, for the success of uh, any technology to monitor health is whether or not the systems can find cows either at the same time or, or a little bit earlier than what people can find cows, because if these systems are telling us that cows are sick, ones that we have found them by other means or probably too late uh, into the disease, they may not be as useful uh, you know, for day-to-day uh, -day management. And at the same time, there is you know, very little information about the patterns of some of these parameters in cows that have health disorders around the time of the disorder. So many times, like for example, this data, uh, we, we tend to look, again, retrospectively at cows that were sick versus not uh, in relationship to the type of calving, but it's more relevant probably to look at this data in relationship to the exact day in which, cow in which cows express uh, clinical signs of disease, okay? So, um, because of this lack of information is that we became interested in working with uh, these technologies and one of the systems in particular. So we uh, were quite interested on this uh, system from SCR Dairy, which basically uh, has what is called the HR tag, which basically is a tag uh, or a device designed to monitor for heats and rumination. So heat, uh, because it keeps track of physical activity, and then rumination, in theory, uh, to monitor cows for health disorders. So uh, this system uh, came available a few years ago, and, and uh, we were quite interested in particular on the idea of using uh, rumination 
to identify cows uh, with, with health disorders. But one of the benefits of this system is that uh, it monitors both parameters at the same time. So uh, both can be combined uh, to identify cows with, uh, with health disorders. So uh, we conducted a research study uh, looking at some uh, uh, aspects of the use of these systems in commercial farms. So one of the main questions that we had was, what would be the performance of these systems to find cows with health disorders? So can these systems alert us of cows that are suffering from a health disorder? So that was one of our uh, main questions. Uh, but the other question that we had was, when would the system alert us of cows that may be suffering from a health disorder. And in this case, we were interested in, in comparing uh, the ability of the system to uh, generate an alert for sick cows in comparison to what farm personnel uh, would be able to do. So basically, two very simple questions. Can the system find cows that become sick? And the second question is, when would the system find uh, these cows that become sick? So we conducted a study at a commercial dairy farm. We enrolled uh, about 1,100 cows uh, from uh, late, uh, late 2013 to uh, late 2014. And the experimental design is very simple. We just put collars on cows about a month uh, pre-calving. The systems need uh, anywhere from four to seven days to generate baseline data for individual cows, because one thing that is important about most of these technologies is that uh, the individual cow is not compared to her herd mates uh, for the parameters of interest, but rather to herself. So the systems need to know, at least some of these systems, at least for some of these parameters, they need to know what are the baseline levels uh, for individual cows. That's why we were interested in measuring all the way from 21 days before calving to 80 days in milk. So we made sure that we had an extra time for baseline data collection. And then uh, after that, we basically collected all the data of our interest, rumination, activity, and data about this health index score, which I'll go on to uh, describe uh, soon. So you can understand what this is about, and you will see it's very important. And then uh, we had uh, farm personnel, which uh, uh, was following strictly some, uh, you know, SOPs uh, you know, that were um, created by the veterinarian, the farmer, and ourselves, keeping track of all the health disorders of interest for our study, as well as some others that we thought that could have an impact on uh, the uh, patterns of interest for our study. So very simple, we just put collars, we monitor cows for health disorders, and one thing that is important to know is that farm personnel did not have access to the data from the system, okay? So they were blind uh, to the information generated by the system, so we could retrospectively compare the performance of the system versus their own uh, performance to find cows with health disorders. So, um, I like to describe the uh, health monitoring program that this farm has intensive. So it, it was a pretty, pretty good uh, health monitoring program. Uh, during uh, the study, cows were monitored on a daily basis, all the way from one to 10 days in milk through direct observation. So every cow would be identified and observed. Body temperature was taken on every single cow. Urine ketones were determined with a keto stick um, uh, strip. And then this farm also had daily meal weights, which were also used uh, to monitor health. Rumen auscult auscultation was used to check for the ACE or any uh, issues with rumen motility or the uh, digestive system. And then uh, any cow that was not diagnosed by eight days in milk with mitritis, so uh, cows that were considered to be healthy by eight days in milk, they were checked uh, through rectal palpation just to make sure that these cows did not slip through the cracks and they were not identified just by visual observation of uterine discharge. So almost like a safety net to make sure that no cows were 
sleeping through uh, without uh, being diagnosed. At the same time, for, uh, for um, mastitis detection, every single cow was being cultured. At the beginning of lactation, and any case of mastitis was cultured as well. After 10 days in milk, uh, the monitoring program was uh, less intense. In particular, body temperature and keto stick was not evaluated for every cow, but daily meal weights continued to be used. Conductivity was still used for mastitis detection. And of course, at least once a day, all cows were checked by farm personnel through visual observation. So again, uh, a pretty uh, comprehensive and detailed health monitoring program, which was very important for us to make sure that if cows were actually becoming sick, if they were suffering from a health disorder, we would not miss these cows uh, for the study. So going back to this idea of the health index report, uh, the health index, what I'm showing you here is this health index report, which I just want you to, uh, you can see there's a lot of information. Uh, these reports uh, can be customized uh, depending on the needs and interests for the farm. But the uh, column of most interest for us in the study and uh, for you to understand our research is the column with uh, the health index here. Basically, this health uh, index score is, uh, is an index value. It's, uh, it's an index value that is generated through the combination of both rumination and activity. And it varies a little bit by days in milk. Sometimes there is more weight on rumination than activity, uh, depending on days in milk. But the basic concept is that this score that ranges from 0 to 100 can be used by dairy farm personnel to identify cows that may be suffering from a health disorder and should be checked, okay? So basically it's putting together the information from activity and rumination and is simplifying it in a single number that farm personnel can check and spot the cows that need attention. Again, the number ranges from zero to 100 and any time that a cow has a value of less than 86 points, she will appear in the report. So in theory, these are the cows that farm personnel should check because they may be suffering from a health disorder. And as you can see, the company has created different color codes. The lower the value for the health index score, the more likely the cow is from suffering a health disorder that is also more likely to be severe. So um, those would be the cows that need the most attention, okay? So for the sake of our study, we consider any cow that had a health index score of less than 86 point to uh, have generated an alarm, okay? So we consider those cows as to have triggered an alarm uh, for checking, okay? So basically, uh, going back to uh, what we did, so we wanted to know how well the system performed and when it found cows. To do that, we had to group cows based on two different criteria, on two uh, parameters. So first of all, whether cows were sick or not at any point during the study. So if they had a health disorder, and then we also used the health index score value to generate a health index positive and a health index negative group. Okay. So, so please, yes. For just yes. For a second. So where does the health index score come from? Did you develop that? Did the company develop that? No. What did they base it on? Yeah. So the health index score uh, was developed by the company, by SCR, and it's based on the combination of rumination and activity. So they have a proprietary algorithm that they develop and uh, they provide that with their software, okay? So a dairy farm that has this system will have the health index score available. So they did like some research that said when rumination yeah. is here and this is here. Yes. So basically, so based on a lot of research, so they have access to data from hundreds of thousands of cows that have colors and they have, they design these algorithms based on preliminary data. And uh, I'll show you how well it works uh, um, with, uh, with our data, right? So, um, but that, that's a really good question. So, um, again, this is created by the companies based on both rumination and activity. So, here we classify, so cows that 
did uh, develop a health disorder and were positive based on health index scores. So basically they had a health index score of less than 86 points. Uh, we consider those cows um, uh, one specific group of animals. Then we had some cows uh, that were diagnosed with a health disorder, but uh, the system did not flag the cow. Is that clear, right? So these inferior cows are the system messed, right? So people at the farm found the cow with a problem, but the system never generated an alert for uh, those cows. And this is all within a seven day window uh, from the day of diagnosis of the disorder. And then we have finally cows that were never sick. So a group of cows that were healthy through the entire duration of the study. And uh, these cows were the ones that we uh, included in our healthy group for comparison to the other two groups. Then uh, in terms of uh, you know, the second question, so when did uh, the system generate an alert uh, for, health, um, for cows with health disorders? Basically, we look at five days before and five days after the day of clinical diagnosis. So we made uh, the day of clinical diagnosis day zero. Uh, we wanted to know if the system generated the alert either before or after people found the cows, okay? So we are basically uh, using uh, the day of clinical diagnosis as our reference point. This is day zero, and we compare everything in relationship to day zero. So uh, enough of uh, study description. Here you have an idea of the number of cows that develop DA, ketosis, and indigestion. So about 100 cows out of the uh, uh, 1,100 cows that we enrolled in the study, about 10% of them have one of these problems. 3.8% had a DA, 5% clinical ketosis, and a small percentage of them had indigestion. And then here you have also the days in milk, as you would expect. and uh, uh, you know, all these cows have these health disorders very early in lactation. So here you have the results for uh, the performance of the system. So remember, we wanted to know if the system would be able to identify these cows with health disorders. So here I'll show you the data for the A, ketosis and indigestion. And there are two uh, pieces of data to look at here. The first column here in the middle is the sensitivity, right? So out of the cows that farm personnel found, what's the percentage that the system was able to identify, okay? So sensitivity, we want it to be 100%. So that's very important uh, for, for these type of uh, systems. And then here you have the number of days in relationship to the day of diagnosis by farm personnel. So how many days before or after the system generated the first alert for cows that suffer the specific disorder? So any time that you see a negative number, that means that the system generated the alert before people identified a cow with a health disorder. So for the A, for example, so the sensitivity was 98%. So the system missed only one cow out of the 41 that had a DA. It only missed uh, one of those. It did not generate an alert, and I'll show you uh, specific data for that cow. And then on average, cows were flagged by the system three days before farm personnel identified the cows, okay? So you have to keep in mind that this is the average, so there's a range, so there's the, this is actually the 95% confidence interval. When you look at the raw data, there are some cows that were identified at the same time or slightly later, but on average, cows were identified three days earlier when they had a DA. For ketosis, the sensitivity of the system was 91%, so still very high sensitivity. I think, if I don't recall wrong, it missed one or two cows out of the 54 and cows were flagged by the system a day and a half before people identify cows. And finally, for indigestion, so remember, we don't have a lot of cows. Only nine cows were diagnosed with indigestion, 89% sensitivity, and cows were identified half a day earlier. It was not a statistically different, uh, which basically is telling us that you know uh, it, it was the same as farm personnel. So we combine all these uh, metabolic and digestive disorders, and for all of them, so we combine.
statistical power. The overall sensitivity is 93%. And on average, cows were identified two days earlier than by farm personnel. Okay? So, as you will see later, I think that we can conclude that for metabolic and digestive disorders, uh, both uh, rumination and activity or this health index score is a pretty good um, marker of these disorders. So what I'm showing you now, too, is the um, pattern. So what happened with the pattern in this case of health index score in relationship to the day of clinical diagnosis? So here we have day zero. This is, again, the day that farm personnel identified the cows five days before and five days after. And you have in green healthy cows, in red those cows that were flagged by the system and in blue, the cows that the system missed, okay? So as you can see, there is a pretty dramatic and you know, statistically different um, difference between cows that were identified by the system. The health index score is lower in these cows until about the day of treatment. So in this case in particular, all cows were treated through surgery, okay? So within about a day or two, these cows went back up for health index score, and within three days of diagnosis, their health index score was similar than that of healthy cows. So uh, not only you can you know, keep track of cows and, and you know, have an idea of whether or not they're suffering a health disorder, but this type of technology may also have a value on monitoring cows after treatment and seeing if they responded to treatment and they are recovering from, from the health disorder. Quite interestingly, uh, and you know, in, unfortunately or fortunately, we only have one cow that the system missed, and you can see why the system did not flag the cow. Her health index score never went below 86 point, which is the cutoff, right? So you know, if you use a higher cutoff, that cow could have been detected, but that may also lead to a lot of false positive outcomes. So there's always a trade-off between you know having high sensitivity and not generating a lot of uh, false positive results. So I'll not spend a lot of time uh, showing you these data. I just want you to know uh, that both rumination and activity followed uh, a similar pattern than health index, and that is expected because health index is created based on rumination and activity, right? So rumination went down all the way to the day of diagnosis. Activity was very low, not as dramatic of a change, but lower than healthy cows. So basically, all the parameters that we measure uh, show the same pattern with a pretty significant difference with healthy cows and a reduction and a nadir within D-day or the day after diagnosis of the disorder, okay? So here you have an example. This is actually a screenshot from the on-farm software, uh, which is called Dataflow for this system in particular. And this is one example of a cow that developed a DA. So here you have calving. It is normal for rumination to drop dramatically around calving. Then cows recover the rumination. Probably this cow did not recover her rumination as much as a healthy cow. She had high rumination for a period of time, and then she had a DA, and the uh, black arrow here is indicating the exact day when the cow was diagnosed by farm personnel. So pretty dramatic change uh, in rumination. Uh, again, this is an individual cow. I, I just showed you before the data for groups of cows, which is consistent with, uh, with this, this individual cow data. So uh, for ketosis, uh, again, in the interest of time, I'll not spend a lot of time showing you the patterns for each parameter, but it, it was the same as for DAs. Cows with ketosis has, had a reduction uh, in health index score around the time of clinical diagnosis. They are much lower than healthy cows. And here you can see how, again, the cows that were not flagged by the system, they did not have a reduction in health index score, which again, you know, is telling us why these cows were not diagnosed. And then uh, finally, cows with indigestion, same thing. So in this case, uh, the drop in health index score is more dramatic, a little bit closer to the day of diagnosis. So basically, uh, it seems like it's a more acute uh, process uh, with indigestion, and that's why the health index score is not lower uh, many days before. 
And then uh, the other thing that we look at that is ki kind of interesting too is uh, what is the difference between five days before to the day of the nadir? And here we were trying more than anything to um, uh, see uh, or test the hypothesis that cows that were not detected by the system, so cows that were health index negative, they had a less severe case of the disease, okay? So not all diseases will have the same severity, right? So we were playing, you know, we were working with that idea. So there will be cows that will be more or less affected by the disorder. So we wanted to explore that and, and look at all the parameters that we measure. So we compare five days before to the nadir for each one of the parameters. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I, I'm just going to tell you that the data supported our hypothesis cows that were not flagged by health index score, they behave more like healthy cows than like cows that were identified by the system. And this is the data for rumination, activity, and health index score. But the one that I want to highlight the most is milk. So look at the differences in milk for the three groups. As you would expect, milk is going up. This is early lactation, so healthy cows have an increase in milk production uh, for this day, uh, five day window. Cows that were not identified by the system, they were not statistically different. So numerically they are different, they are you know, lower uh, than healthy cows, but statistically not different. And then you have here the group of cows that were identified by the system. There is a dramatic, a very dramatic reduction in milk production. There is you know, almost, you know, a 40 uh, kilogram difference in milk uh, with the healthy cows uh, for this period of time. So again, this data would suggest or would, or would support the hypothesis that these cows had a more severe case of the disease and uh, because of that the system is more capable of finding these cows that cows that are not expressing as dramatic of a change in activity, rumination and health index score. And you will see this, this becomes even more important for other disorders such as metritis and mastitis. So basically we can conclude uh, for, for metabolic and digestive disorder that the system uh, is effective to find uh, these type of problems. Uh, cows with the ACE and ketosis are identified earlier than farm personnel. And then there were no, at least statistically, significant differences in milk between healthy cows and cows that the system messed, okay? So if we want to use milk as our marker of cow well-being and, and um, you know, our marker of productivity, at least the cows that the system is not finding are not as affected uh, by these health disorders. So I'll show you now the data for metritis and mastitis. Um, so quite a different story here in terms of overall performance. So now uh, about 55% of the cows were detected of those that had metritis. Those cows that were detected were detected earlier, okay? So about a day uh, earlier than the diagnosis by farm personnel. So when we saw this data for metritis, so we thought that uh, it would be even more evident with cows with metritis, the potential differences in severity. Okay, we thought that you know it's, it's more likely that uh, metritis would lead to a wide range of severity. Okay, we may have cows that have metritis uh, cases that are, are really bad that are affecting the cow a lot, and then we may have cows that just have a little bit of uh, uterine infection. Uh, the the you know the discharge is uh, is smelly and and. Uh, it has the brown, red brownish color, right? So those cows were diagnosed with metritis. So this farm had a very stringent uh, criteria. So they were very um, uh, conservative and they prefer to treat cows than let them go without treatment. So uh, we explore different options to identify cows with uh, different severity. Quite interestingly, when we, lo we look at fever, there was absolutely no difference in the sensitivity of the system. We expected that cows that have fever 
would be would have you know a higher sense the system would have had a higher sensitivity and that was not the case uh, and that has to do with the fact that not all cows with mitritis have fever and i'll leave it there if you guys want to talk later about that we can um, because uh, it can lead to a lot of discussion but then um, we look at the treatment that cows receive because the uh, farm was using two different type of antibiotic treatment based on their own assessment of uh, the severity of the case. So has, uh, because cows treated with the cephalosporin with ceftiofur uh, did not have any uh, uh, withholding uh, of milk. So the milder cases were treated with cephalosporins, right, with ceftiofur, whereas the more severe cases were treated with ampicillin or oxytetracycline, and these cows had to go to the hospital pen and milk needed to be discarded. But to us, it was a pretty good indication of severity of mitritis. And interestingly, when we look at the uh, sensitivity of these two groups, it did not change or it was a slightly lower for the cows that far, farm personnel thought that they had a milder case and it went up to 83% for the severe cases. Okay, so again, this is supporting this whole idea that when the cows are not feeling well at all, when they are truly affected by the disorder, the system will be able to identify these cows. Okay, so that data we think that is, is pretty supportive. Uh, same thing with health index score, again, in relationship to the day of clinical diagnosis. Cows flagged by the system had a pretty dramatic reduction in health index score. Cows that did not have, that were not flagged by the system, they just behaved as healthy cows. Male production, the same thing. So here you have male production in kilos per day in relationship to the day of diagnosis. And again, cows that were flagged by the system, they had lower male production as you know, far as four days before diagnosis of the disorder as compared to healthy cows and cows that were uh, not um, flagged by the system. This is, you know, sorry I didn't mention it before, this is the data for primiparous cows, but it's exactly the same or even more dramatic for multiparous cows with a larger difference for cows that were identified by the system. So we uh, also looked, we were very interested on, on keep build, you know, generating data to say these cows are different. The cows are the system flag versus not. So we look at the uh, pattern or the proportion of cows DMB uh, up to 60 days in milk and through the entire lactation. And cows that were flagged by the system were twice as likely to be coded as do not breed. So basically be called, uh, you know, or be coded as do not breed, so they're called uh, later on. So 7% of these cows were coded as do not breed up to 60 days in milk versus 3% of the cows that were not flagged and 25 for healthy cows. So one of the interesting thing too is that when you look at repro performance for first breeding, so days in milk to first breeding and pregnancies per AI or conception rate, there are no differences, right? The reason for that is that these cows are already gone. They don't make it to first breeding, right? So these cows that were more severely affected by mitritis, they were either gone from the herd or at least not bred, right? They were coded as do not breed. So very, you know, you know, you know, basic terms is telling us that you know that that is a reason for the lack of difference in conception rates or days in milk to first breeding again so just more data uh, supporting this idea of different severity so i'm going to show you the last piece of data so this is mastitis now so we were also interested in the performance of the system uh, for uh, mastitis and uh, similar that and for mitritis, the overall sensitivity was in the 50s, so 53%. Again, cows that were flagged by the system were flagged earlier than farm personnel. As you would expect, we found some differences between clinical and subclinical, and subclinical is almost irrelevant. I mean, these cows are found through somatic cell counts, so the more, uh, the more interesting cows are the cows with clinical disorders. So, we also thought here that there would be differences 
in this case, we look by pathogen. So we, we know that a cow that is going through a case of uh, mastitis caused by E. coli, a case of toxic mastitis, will be, you know, affected more than a cow that just is affected by a gram-positive case of mastitis or chronic mastitis by staph aureus. So you can see here cows that had mastitis caused by E. coli, you know, we had an 81% sensitivity and sensitivity was not any better for the other type of pathogens. So again, supporting this idea that these cows that are truly uh, affected by, in this case, mastitis, they would be identified by the system. So um, same thing that we did for the other ones. Again, cows that were not identified by the system behave more than healthy cows than cows that are uh, identified or flagged by the system. In this case, for mastitis, cows that were not identified by the system, they were intermediate between cows identified by the system and healthy cows. And you can see that even better here uh, when we look at male production for the five days before mastitis. So cows that were not flagged by the system, they behave very similarly than cows that were identified. The reason for that is that the cause for decreased male production is different. Here is inflammation affecting the mammary gland, right? Which is very different than mitritis or DAs. That is something that is affecting the overall status of the cow, is affecting her dry matter intake, the way that she eats, her rumination time. With mastitis, the, uh, the inflammation is directly affecting the other, and that's why these cows, regardless of whether or not they were identified by the system, they would have reduced a dramatic reduction in male production. Okay? So, uh, the last thing about the uh, performance of the system, which is also very important, right? So you want these technologies to tell you which cows are sick, but you also don't want these technologies to drive you crazy, telling you that you have a lot of sick cows that are not, right? So the false positive rate is also very important, okay? So at least for our study, uh, the false positive rate of health index score was very low. So it was about 2.4%. So you have to expect about 3% of the cows that every day would be flagged by the system when they did not have uh, any issues. So again, you know, this is quite important because if farms are trying to use this uh, 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 type of index to generate a list of cows, you don't want to have a list overpopulated with cows that do not have a problem. So uh, another thing that is important too is uh, the number or the proportion of tags or sensors that fail, right? So, you know, these technologies are great. At least this, you know, this system in particular that we work with is very robust. It was very reliable, but there are always accidents. You know, you know, cows are in a very rough environment, so you have to think that these tags are hitting, you know, pipes in headlocks and you know, at different parts of the dairy all the time. So that may be a reason as well as other reasons, about 4%, you know, 3.7% of the tax malfunction during the study, okay? Which is actually a pretty low number. Uh, some of the tax can also be misplaced. So these tax in particular have to be at a very specific um, uh, part of the neck in order to record rumination accurately. So that, that's also important, they have to be um, in the right place in the neck. So it could have been either a combination of tags that malfunction or were misplaced. The good thing is that when, when a tag is not working or is misplay, misplaced, uh, what you have is a graph like this, which is basically incompatible with life. That cow should be dead, okay? So uh, basically uh, the system does have a report of tags that should be checked because they are either not working or they are in the wrong place, okay? So every day, you know, dairy personnel can go and, and make sure that uh, it's not a tag problem or that the cow, yeah, it's not, uh, you know, her legs up, uh, okay? <laughs> so anyway, so that's, that's quite important there. So just to finalize, I'll give you a little bit of my perspective on how these technologies uh, can be used on farms. So, uh, you know, again, so I, I think that based on this 
this one study that we have done is pretty comprehensive and large, but it's one study. There is a lot more research to do. I think that you know these systems are effective to find cows with metabolic and digestive disorders. Uh, the low sensitivity observed for mitritis and mastitis may have to do with the severity of the disorder. We are doing some follow-up research now. Unfortunately, we did not have a good criteria to uh, uh, separate cows in different severity levels. We are doing that now and uh, trying to understand that a little bit better. Uh, and then in terms of timing, so it found cows with DA, ketosis, mitritis, and mastitis earlier than farm personnel. So. Uh, it may be great uh, to find cows earlier than what we usually find cows with our traditional monitoring programs. Uh, so that may be an opportunity to treat cows earlier, uh, prevent some cows from developing um, a severe disorder, or for example, a cow with ketosis from developing a DA. But there may be some challenges associated with that as well, right? So among the opportunities, again, so earlier treatment, which can improve the response, it can improve the cow well-being, and we can prevent some of the associated disorders. But on the challenge side, uh, it, it may be a little bit tricky uh, because uh, we may be going to check a cow that is not showing any clinical sign of health disorders, right? So, you know, the system may be telling us that the cow is having an issue and uh, farm personnel goes, checks the cow, and, and she looks fine. So that might be a challenge, right? So we still need to learn a little bit more about, you know, what these systems are telling us, what, you know, the pattern, you know, the changes in the pattern of these parameters are telling us. Uh, of course, uh, we could use uh, prophylactic treatments but that will depend on what type of treatment. You know, probably we don't want to give just antibiotics to cows because we suspect that they are having uh, an infection. There may be other things that are less problematic, like for example, the propylene glycol drench or you know, a general you know drench with fluids. So those things may may be used in the future. Uh, so that may be uh, something you know that we would probably uh, be testing, uh, but again, we still need to learn a lot. So we have to figure out, uh, you know, how to deal with some of this information. It, it is too early. It could be too problematic, and, and farms can get frustrated because they go on to check cows that are not showing any signs of health disorders. As I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation, we had two type of farms, right? We had the ones that do a lot, so you know the ones that are in the middle, the ones that invest a bit of time, labor, and resources to check cows, and we have the ones that do nothing. That you know those are the minority of the farm. So the way that you know we are thinking about this is that there are opportunities for this type of monitoring technologies for both type of farms. For those that do nothing, so with you know little or no intervention. I think that there is an opportunity to identify cows that are not being identified, right? So cows that would benefit by receiving a treatment and changing the course of disease or uh, preventing some of the issues uh, these disorders are causing for production, reproduction, and so on. On the other hand, for farms that have very intensive health monitoring programs, I think that there is an opportunity to scale back a little bit and let these technologies uh, do the first scanning, you know, the first search of cows. You know, for sure, these technologies uh, uh, seem to be able to identify the cows that are going through the most severe problems. And then we can still implement, you know, uh, routine checks at a specific days in milk to find those cows that the system fail uh, to identify. So in this case, I think that there is a bit of an opportunity to reduce labor. And again, going back to this idea of reducing the, uh, the cow manipulation and how we are disrupting these cow normal behaviors just by trying to help them, right? By trying to identify cows that are having health problems, we may be uh, causing some uh, you know, other negative consequences on cows. So again, uh, we have these two extreme cases in the middle. There are a lot of other different uh, alternatives and, and uh, different type of uh, management programs. So the way that farms can use this type of um, 
uh, uh, indexes or, or data. Uh, for example, they could add the uh, health index score or if you like to have the individual parameters such as rumination, activity or any other parameter that any of these systems may be generating to the uh, fresh cow list. So it's another uh, marker of the uh, overall status of the cow. So that's one uh, potential uh, way of using it. And then the other option is to reduce the number of cows to check. Basically, just going by, for example, the health index in this case, or again, any other index or any other parameter generated by any other system that is telling us these are the cows that need attention. Go check these cows. And then, uh, you know, con you're concentrated most of the time on the cows that, that need the attention. So, um, technologies will keep improving. So, they are constantly evolving. So, there will be improvements in the future with new algorithms that are more accurate. Different ways of reporting is incredible. The, the number and the variety of reports that can be generated with these systems. And I think that one of the critical things, too, is integration with other parameters. So as we have more and more sensors available and more information about our cows, I think that we will be able to improve the accuracy of the algorithm, just putting more information uh, from different sensors together. Okay, so I think that there will be, you know, an evolution of these systems that is actually happening now, and they just keep getting better. You know, the one thing that it would be nice if they, they keep getting cheaper as well. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude my presentation. I really want to thank the uh, collaborating farm that helped us with this research, SCR Dairy for all the support that they provided, and of course, the uh, people that did the actual work, my, my students and my technicians. And with that, I'll be open to questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. <laughs> but folks, if you have some questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat box. Um, let me see if we already have some. Not yet. So folks, I'll give you a couple of moments to um, go ahead and uh, put your questions in the chat box. In the meantime, I had, um, do you guys have any other questions before I? No, okay, so I can ask. So, so Julio, it looked to me like um, for the, uh, DAs and ketosis that the rumination um, monitors had a more had a more striking dip than the activity yeah. monitors. So could you get away with just using rumination for those to, to pinpoint those prop yeah. issues? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question, Kathy. So it's is a question of what is the best parameter to identify specific disorders. I'm just giving the example of DA. So maybe rumination. It's a great parameter to look at it, and you don't need activity. So that's a possibility. We have not looked at it independently, in, so individually. Um, it's something that we are working on. Um, I do think, again, that uh, the trend is to actually keep integrating more sensors and more data from different sensors together. So um, I, I see all of this area of technology going in that direction. Um, but I cannot give you a definitive answer right now. I, you know, it's just my speculation, okay, mm -hmm. based on the data that we have is that for metabolic and digestive disorders, rumination may be better than activity, okay? okay? But it's just pure speculation. We still haven't looked at that in detail. But that's okay. a good, really good point. Okay. Um, and then I had um, another question for you. So you, you said at the end of the presentation that the cost of the technology could decrease, make it even more attractive. But does it look like when you look, like thinking from your vet perspective, when you look at being able to catch diseases earlier, um, but like the ketosis and the uh, DAs, does it look like that even at the cost they are now, does it look like there is, um, that, it, that the systems could be cost effective if you're yeah. able to decrease labor yeah. too and all that? Yeah. So no, first of all, my comment is just the wish, like we always wish things are cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they don't break even today with, with the cost they have. Um, so we haven't done any thorough economic analysis of these technologies. I think that there's a lot to gain. So there's mm -hmm. a lot to gain on cow health, improved productivity and overall performance. Um, so, um, again, I, we haven't looked at it in detail. I, I think that it, they may break even quite well. Um, 
I would say too that sometimes uh, the motivation for these technologies may not necessarily be uh, economics, but uh, just uh, reduce labor. Just yeah, and, and reduce labor not even from the perspective of the cost of labor, just reduce the amount of time and effort that people have to put on finding cows. So um, this morning the uh, uh, the present Stacy uh, mm -hmm. right uh, who presented about robotic. You know, the oh, robotic sure, farm, sure, right? Sure, so yeah. uh, dairy farmers who have robot farms, they are always, you know, trying to, um, you know, reduce probably the amount of time and effort that they, you know, they spend uh, working with their cows and, and letting cows be. So uh, I think that, you know, sometimes it goes beyond economics. You also have to remember that there may be other potential benefits such as heat detection, right? So whenever you have activity on a tag, uh, you have the opportunity of using it for heat detection. So that also adds economic value. So I think that it depends on a lot of factors. It depends a lot on the motivation from the farm. Uh, it also depends on, you know, the overall management of the farm, right? I mean, maybe they have very low incidence of health disorders. That it's not worth, you know, investing so much, right? So uh, there are a lot of things to think about. I think that we still have to learn a lot both about the performance and the economics of yeah. the system. So, good. Anything else before I pull you off the hook? Okay, great. Another thing that we used to forecast. Yes. How well do they predict? Okay. Repeat yes. that. I don't know uh, sure everyone could hear. So the question from uh, from Rob is how well uh, the system may have predicted time of calving. So uh, I. My presentation was long enough already, right? <laughs> we are doing a lot of research with calving prediction. So we have some interesting data uh, that uh, uh, it seems like there is quite a bit of predictive value on, on these parameters for calving. Uh, but I, I will not share the data yet, but we're working on that. The other thing that is very interesting is that cows that develop a health disorder in the postpartum period they were already ruminating less than cows that were healthy in the postpartum period. So there seems to be already a difference between cows that will become sick and healthy cows within a week pre-calving. So we're also exploring that. So we want to see if it is possible to predict which cows will become sick in the postpartum period. Not to treat them probably, but just to pay more attention to maybe uh, take you know some precautions you know you know different uh, uh, management strategies with these cows like paying more attention during calving maybe keeping them a couple more days you know in the calving pen and uh, and getting to a better start so there's a lot to learn again and and uh, we have some data showing that there are differences very early on so. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions for today. So thanks very much, Julio. Yeah, really appreciate it. Excellent presentation. And thanks to all of you for joining today's uh, uh, conference.